Good morning, church family. I just wanted to welcome you to worship this morning. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, Kyle and Macy Tanner leading us in worship. And um, I I know that uh, God will move powerfully among his people as we worship him. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, give you just a little bit of an update and uh, pray for us before we get going in in worship. Um, You know, one of the hardest parts of sheltering in has been the inability uh, to gather together for weekend services and assembly. Uh, while live streams and recorded sermons have helped to kind of fill us, fill us up amid this uh, lockdown, we've all been longing for the day when we can return uh, for worship together in person. And uh, I have some good news for you. Our deacons and uh, staff met last Tuesday evening and discussed the possibility of reopening uh, for Sunday morning worship at Memorial. This opening will be for Sunday morning worship only. Um, We've set a tentative date of June 7th, um, and so that we can uh, worship together. Um, However, as we plan to open our doors again, we must acknowledge that Sundays are, are going to look and feel different for a while. I mean, staying several seats apart, disinfecting surfaces, wearing masks, foregoing uh, communion and and church coffee uh, may be the new normal for the near future. It will be awkward, but the church can and will persevere. So we're tentatively looking at this date of June 7th uh, as our in-person worship only start date. And uh, this will be phase two of our four phase plan to reopen. We'll be adding other ministries like Sunday school, youth, college ministry, team kids at a later date in phases three and four as it becomes safe to do so. Obviously, our ultimate goal is for all of our ministries to be up and running. And we will be receiving and sending out a, a letter into your mailbox outlining our reopening plan for Memorial. Please help us. Please help us to do the things that we need to to exercise wisdom in moving forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, uh, we have postponed our NBC get-together for this afternoon. Uh, in my enthusiasm and, and hopefulness, I am a very optimistic type person. Uh, I was a bit premature and optimistic in announcing a churchwide get-together. Uh, This event will be postponed until we can uh, plan some future events uh, when we feel it is safe to do so. I miss you all so much, and I want us to be together. And my heart is for each one of you and to be with you. Uh, I hope you understand. I I know this is not easy for any of us. Uh, Let's have a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into our worship time. Loving Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity you give us to to worship uh, in our homes. Uh, Father, I pray that you would just um, um, be with the worship of your people, Father, that you would inhabit those those praises. And Father, that you would guide us into a a time of of reflection, a time of the the Holy Spirit uh, searching out our hearts. And Father, that, that you would be with those within our congregation who are struggling right now, I know there are families that are going through tremendous difficulty. And so I pray, Father, for comfort for them. I pray that you would just lift them up. I pray, Father, that that we would intercede for them behind the scenes. Father, helping to make up what is lacking. But Father, you are a great and mighty God, and you know where we are. And it is our joy to worship you today. I pray that you would be glorified in everything that we say, think, and do. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hey, good morning, church family. It's good to see you all today. It's good to be here worshiping with you. 
even though we're not in the very same place, hey, we are together. Um, this morning, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for continuing to give and continue to support. And uh, I want to encourage you this morning, and I want to share a verse out of Mark, and it talks about the widow. And uh, it says Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything, all that she had to live. It, it does, it's not about the amount, it's about, it's about, the, uh, about how you intended for it how you intended it and some people think well God doesn't pay any attention or he doesn't look at what I do but God's watching us all the time obviously Jesus was watching this lady now several years ago I had a friend that went to Israel and he came back and he brought me this little bitty coin this is a widow's mite and it's I mean it doesn't weigh anything and it's smaller than a penny about two-thirds the size of a penny but it's thin, it's not, it's not a whole lot bigger than a piece of paper, but he brought me this mite and I thought about this lady and she puts in two of these, two of these little coins that you could barely even hit, hear hit the table. But Jesus noticed it. Jesus notices what we do. He's interested in what we do. And you know, if, if, uh, if some, at some point in our life, which I, I know that we all would like to hear a well done, good and faithful servant. If he notices what we do and we are giving like this lady did in the right spirit and for the right reason, then God is seeing that. He's paying attention to that. He wants us to give lovingly with the right kind of heart, just like she did. Jesus said they give out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in everything all she had to live on that may we be that way not only in giving of our tithes and offerings to god but in how we serve other people our time our energy helping other people helping our neighbors helping the brothers and sisters in christ everything we do it's important that we give as god would have us to let's pray thank you father for this day and thank you for the opportunity father to to be able to give a small portion back to you God, we recognize it's not about the amount. As these rich people put in big amounts of coins, it's about giving from our heart, giving what you'd have us to. And so we thank you that we have the privilege to give. We thank you that you love us enough to give us the opportunity to give back to you, knowing that you don't need our money, but you, you're giving us the opportunity to show our love to you. So we thank you and we praise you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. God bless you. You have a great day, and we continue to worship. Uh, see you all in a couple of weeks. Love you. Bye.
Father, Lord, thank you so much for, um, God, just the, the love that you have for us that doesn't have um, any comparison, God. Um, God, there is absolutely nothing like it, and just thank you so much for allowing us to experience it, God. God, and for your grace and your mercies that are new every morning. God, we thank you for that as well. I just pray that you would continue to move and work in this time in our hearts, God. God, we want to um, just hear what you have for us today and be open to um, whatever it is that, that you want to show us, God. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you, Kyle and Macy Tanner, for leading us in worship, and what a joy it is to, to worship together. Um, you know, I checked my notes, and I realized that it's been a while uh, since I've given a Bible quiz. And so uh, here's a, a new little test for you, and I'll give you a hint. All the questions have to do with the Old Testament, okay? So let's just have a little fun with this. Um, who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? Okay, I'll let you off the hook here. Samson, because he brought the house down. <laughs> oh, I know, it's a groaner, right? Uh, who is the greatest male financier in the Bible? Give you a minute to think about it. Well, it's Noah, because he was floating his stock while everyone else was in liquidation. <laughs> uh, well, who is the greatest female financier in the Bible? Nope, that's not it. Nope, that's not it. Pharaoh's daughter, she went down to the bank of the Nile and pulled out a little profit. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite right here. Who is the greatest babysitter mentioned in the Bible? <laughs> David, because he rocked Goliath to sleep. <laughs> oh, and this is the last one. Okay, I promise it'll be the last one. Um, who is the shortest man in the Bible? Old Testament. Nehemiah. <laughs> oh, seriously, we're going to be kicking off an eight part sermon series based on the book of Nehemiah. And we're calling that a, a vision for leaders. And Nehemiah is one of the great characters of the Old Testament, but perhaps not as well known as, as many of the others. I just want to say that there is no type of service that any of us can undertake which is filled with so much potential as being in the service for our master. You know, on the one hand, there's so much about it that's rewarding. And on the other hand, there is so much about it that can be disappointing. You know, there are many obstacles to overcome and lots of pitfalls to be avoided. I mean, how many times, how many times have we taken up a task in the name of the Lord only to retreat or to get beaten or to be discouraged or confounded and yet somehow encouraged to fight better in the war? You know, for every frustration and discouragement that is allowed to come to us, in order that through it we may be thrown totally helpless at the foot of our Savior's feet. A lot of times we think it's us that is doing it. But what happens is when we find ourselves at Jesus' feet, then we return to the battle again, no longer trusting in the false, insufficient human resources, which so foolishly had taken, we had taken into the battle with us, but now trusting in the limitless resources of our risen Lord. I really want these, this series to be an encouragement to you. Because, you know, most pastors and most of the pastors that I know uh, would agree that the foundational issue in any church is leadership. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And let me just say this. Our world right now is in need of great leaders. And if you're not planning to provide great leadership in your area, then please step aside so that great leaders can emerge and, and rise and lead. I mean, stop standing in the way and blocking great leaders from leading. I mean, there's lots of possible studies on leadership. 
Moses offers a great example of a reluctant leader. Um, Joshua is a picture of a young leader. Uh, Noah would be a perfect candidate for a persistent leader. David certainly qualifies as a, a fallen leader. But when I think of Old Testament candidates for the title of visionary leader, one jumps immediately to my mind, and it's Nehemiah. I mean, Nehemiah, his story is an unbelievable story. He starts out as a, a cupbearer to the king. You know, that's a fancy title for the, being the king's wine taster, a job that most pastors would not want to put on their resume. You know, in the ancient world, the cupbearer was an influential official with direct and constant access to the king. So what does a cupbearer do? Well, he drinks the king's cup to check for poison. So was that an important job? You bet your king's life it was. Literally, the king's life was completely in his hand or on his plate. See, I see Nehemiah's life as a total life of sacrifice every time he sampled something for the king. But Nehemiah, in his humility, has to tell us what he did for a living so that the next chapter makes sense in his talking to the king. Nehemiah ends up being a visionary leader, I want to say without equal. You know, there's no winning without war warring or working. There's no opportunity without opposition. There's no open door set before us without there being many adversaries to obstruct our entering. You know, whenever the saints say, hey, let's arise and build, the enemy says, let's arise and oppose. There's no triumph without trial. There's no victory without vi vigilance. There's no cross Excuse me, there is a cross in the way of every crown that's worth wearing. See, lessons and analogies are everywhere throughout the book of Nehemiah. There are the walls of the city of God to be built in the individual human heart. There are the walls of the city of God to be built among the nations of the earth. Nehemiah exemplifies the vital principles that are involved in all such building if it is to be successful building in the truest sense of the, of the word. Nehemiah himself stands out as conspicuously as a man of prayer, a man of faith, a man of courage, and a man of action. You know, the, the book of Nehemiah could be studied in many different ways. And here is a plan I would recommend. I mean, as we study Nehemiah as a visionary leader... I offer you over the coming weeks kind of an eight-step process for leadership. I invite you to take notes to implement these principles into your life. And I want to give those eight uh, principles and, and steps right now. Uh, but each week we're going to be unpacking one of those principles. Okay, It's kind of an overview of the series. Um, step one is to prepare the vision. Before we can receive God's vision, we must prepare for it. Before we can receive it, we've got to be ready for it. Uh, the second step is to define vision. I mean, three essential questions must be answered by every leader. What is our purpose? Who is our target? And what is our strategy? Third is to plant the vision. Vision is a living seed that must be planted in the hearts of other leaders. That way they know what the plan is. So we plant the vision. Fourthly, we share the vision. Vision must be effectively communicated with others. They can't jump on board unless they know what the vision is. Number five is implement the vision. How the vision is implemented is vital to the success of the vision. It has to be done with wisdom. It has to be done with lots of thought, lots of prayer. So implementing the vision. Step six is to deal with opposition. I mean, no what to expect, and how to stay on track. You're going to be opposed. Anybody that is doing anything in the kingdom of God is going to have opposition. Just know that. Deal with that. Okay, step seven is to make adjustments. Some adjustments have to be made as you go along. Uh, 
not, it's not always the picture in our mind that we end up, that it ends up coming to fruition. Sometimes it looks a little bit different. We have to make those adjustments. And the last step is to evaluate the results. And I would give you eight evidences that the vision is complete. So this morning we want to dive right into uh, step one of prepare uh, for vision. We have to be prepared for that. You know, in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not been entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. That's a huge verse. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. Everything that God has prepared for man and for those who love him. So what is vision? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> vision is a picture of what God wants to do. Vision is a picture of what God wants to do. And I would imagine that most of us are familiar with Proverbs uh, 29, 18. And it says this, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. See, vision is the active process of following a dynamic God, which means we must keep dreaming, keep envisioning, to keep our ministries and churches from perishing. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And so we must keep dreaming, keep envisioning what God has for us and what God is actively involved with, following this dynamic God, this awesome God that we serve. See, if vision is a picture of what God wants to do in his church, and if the key to vision is joining God in what he wants to do, and if what God wants to give us is his vision, then when we are prepared for vision, God gives it to us. The reality is many of us are not prepared for the vision that God wants to give us. I want us to begin, I want to read in Nehemiah chapter 1. If you have your scripture and would turn there with me. Nehemiah chapter 1. We're just going to begin uh, and read down through this first chapter. There's 11 verses. And it's a little bit lengthy, but it'll be fine. God's word says this in Nehemiah chapter 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that... Hanina, excuse me, Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. When I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I was fasting and praying before the, the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who perseveres the covenant, excuse me, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness of those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word which you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote part of the, the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them uh, to the place where I have chosen to cause my name to dwell. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I beseech you, may your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant 
and to the prayer of your servants who delight to revere your name. And make your servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. That is God's word. What an amazing thing we see taking place here. So I go back and I ask the question, what are the steps of preparation? And I would say to you this morning, the first thing is to collect information. Um, Nehemiah began his search for vision by gathering information. And one of his brothers had just returned from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah, he, he questioned them in, in verse 2 of our passage. So why would he question them? Why would he question them? Because vision is best birthed out of a, a thorough knowledge. We talk about having vision. It's best birthed out of a thorough knowledge. Contrary to what some people think, it is not unspiritual to think. To use your head. I mean, sometimes we say, well, you're not exercising faith. They are not exclusively opposite they you know when we we think about thinking and we think about putting our mind to work he is lord of our mind as well you know love god with all your mind strength power all your heart it's not unspiritual to think it's okay to use your brain thinking is allowed because the cost of not thinking is too great See, this year I have been preaching on discipleship. I've been preaching on evangelism. I've been preaching on the Great Commission. All laying the groundwork for vision. So there's two areas that we really need to go to school on as far as a church body. Um, the first one is the unchurched people in our area, in our community. And please, don't make the mistake of thinking that you know who they are. You might be surprised. Take the time. Do the research. Find who the unreached people in our community are. The second thing is that we need to go to school on the churches who are reaching the unchurched people. I mean, when you want to learn how to do something, you go to school uh, on the folks who are already proving that they know how to do it. Um, learn from others that are practitioners, that are actually doing the work. Not people that are wrapped up in theory, not people that are wrapped up in book knowledge, but people who are actually reaching the unchurched. Because we can learn from them. It's okay to do your thinking. It's okay to use your brain. So we have to uh, be prepared for that and, and, and go to school on that and collect information. That's what we see Nehemiah doing. He says that, Hanani, one of my brothers and some men from Judah came and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. He's gathering information. Hey, tell me what you know about the Jews. Tell me what you know about Jerusalem. Tell me what's going on over there. He's, he's, he's birthing a vision of what God wants him to do. Secondly, I would say there has to be a, a holy discontent with the status quo. Nehemiah wrote these words. He was brokenhearted. The walls had been down for years. But all of a sudden, he experienced a holy discontent with that fact. That the walls were down, that they were broken. See, vision is usually birthed out of a heartache, out of a burden, out of a desire to do something, out of a brokenness over a situation. I mean, how many times did Jesus weep over the lost sheep of Israel? How many times did Moses stand in the gap for the Israelites? How many times did Jeremiah weep for the burden that he carried? You see, all of these things are so important in what we are doing and how a, ver a, a vision is to be birthed. So as long as we are content with the status quo, 
You know what the, the word status quo means in Latin? Literally, it means the existing state. Like the current state we are in. I'm not talking about Texas, just talking about the, what's going on. But I like to think of it like this. It means the, the mess that we're currently in. See, as long as we are content with the status quo, we will never discover God's vision. We're comfortable. We're content. As long as we're comfortable with the way things are, you cannot receive God's vision. As long as you're happy with the status quo, God will not speak. Vision usually comes in times of desperation. Of times of desiring and wanting something different than what is the mess that we're in. See, I'm sure those exiles in Persia longed for things to go back the way they were. Oh yeah, they had been at it 70 years. 70 years their world had been upside down. Things only have been upside down for us for a few weeks. And oh, how we're longing for it to go back to the way it was. Think about 70 years. Think about generations of people not being able to worship in Jerusalem at the temple. That should inform us in the times that we're at. I mean, think about that. Why do we long to get back to what's comfortable when maybe, just maybe, God has taken us to a different place? See, as long as we're content with the status quo, we will not discover God's vision. Notice also the fasting in verse 4. Nehemiah said, when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the Lord God of heaven. See, most of us, most of us know, know little to nothing about fasting. But I want you to understand that it is a scriptural process. It is a spiritual discipline. And it's a big part of preparing for vision. Here is a working definition of fasting. Giving up food or some other activity in order to devote more serious time and attention to prayer. It's going to cost us something. This fasting... It means doing without food. It means doing without social media. It means doing without some of the comforts that we enjoy in order to spend more time and attention in prayer. Why fast? Why would anybody fast? Because fasting is as serious a form of prayer as any that we have. It tells God, I'm serious about this. It tells God, I want something done here. Father, I need some help here. And listen, vision is usually birthed out of a serious search for God's direction. If we're content, if we're just going about our day and, and continuing as, as it always does, business as usual, God's not going to show up. He's not going to give us something new unless we are seeking Him. And that's, that's truly what Nehemiah is doing here. How can we claim we are seriously searching for God's plan when we've not fasted in order to seek God? Notice also the prayer. Prayer is one of the overriding themes in this book. And I want to submit to you that it's the secret to Nehemiah's success. The prayer in chapter 1 is the first of 12 different prayers recorded in this book. It begins with prayer in Persia and it closes with prayer in Jerusalem. His prayers are filled with adoration in chapters 8 and 9, thanksgiving in chapter 12, confession in chapters 1 and 2, petition in chapters 1 and 2. There are prayers of anguish, there are prayers of joy, there are prayers of protection, prayers of dependence and, and commitment. It's a story of compassionate, persistent, personal, and corporate prayer. See, prayer gives Nehemiah perspective. It widens his horizons. It sharpens his vision. And hear this, it dwarfs his anxieties. 
Listen to Nehemiah's prayer in these verses. 5 and 6. I beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love Him and keep His commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to, the, to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you night and day. Di- excuse me, day and night on behalf of the sons of Israel as your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel which we have sinned against you. I and my father's house have sinned. He's confessing his sin to God. He's open. He's bearing his soul before Almighty God. See, he fasted for several days, but he prayed for several months. He bathed his vision in prayer from start to finish. And Nehemiah knew the success of his vision depended upon prayer. See, one problem that we have with receiving God's vision is hearing God's voice. Psalm 46.10 tells us to be still and know that I am God. Listen. Listen. Those who talk with God most hear God best. And those who do not talk to God often usually do not hear Him at all. Let me share this verse with you, a very familiar verse, one of my favorite. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, says this. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. (laughs) That sounds a lot like vision, doesn't it? I mean, God's plan to, to prosper his people. But notice what verse 12 says. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will speak, excuse me, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's what Nehemiah was doing. He was searching with all his heart. See, vision is usually giving to, given to those who pray until they get it. Seeking God with all of our heart. If we seek Him with all of our heart, He will give us His vision. We will hear His voice. If prayer is not the octane, that fuels your vision, your vision will stall out and you will end up being motionless because you will run out of gas. There is no shortcut to vision. We must pray if we want vision because God gives vision to people of prayer. Lastly, I need to mention waiting. Notice the the behind-the-scenes waiting going on in Nehemiah's vision. The wall of Jerusalem has been down for 70 years. Nehemiah had been in the king's service for 20 years. He had been the king's cupbearer for 20 years. There is a four-month time lapse between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Kislev in 1-1 is the Persian name for the month of December. Nisan in chapter 2 is the Persian name for April. So what did Nehemiah do between December and April? The four months between December and April, what did he do? He waited. Vision is usually given to those who patiently wait for it. See, the problem is, is that we hate to wait. We want things instantly. And when we don't get what we want or what we think we deserve, we begin griping and complaining. Sometimes in our churches we think that we can grow and be mature in faith overnight. We just don't want to have to wait it out. We don't want to have to wait up for anything. We want to go from being a total mess one day to to being a Billy Graham the next. But when it comes to vision, we do the same thing. We want to go from asking God for vision one day to having every single detailed piece worked out the next day. But folks, that's not. That is not how it works. Here's a working definition for waiting 
on God's will. Doing the right thing in the right way for the right motive at the right time. A working definition of God's will. See, this is an important starting point. It's so easy for us to stay uninvolved and unaware. Some of us don't want to even think about stuff that's going on in our own lives, much less take the time to investigate what's happening in the lives of others. Even though Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem, get that, he's never been to Jerusalem. He'd been serving the king for 20 years. When he heard stories about it, he knew that his ancestors had been led away in chains when Babylon destroyed it. He was doing what Jeremiah 5150 instructed the exiles to do. It said, remember the Lord in a distant land and think on Jerusalem. As he thought on Jerusalem, he listened to the report that the survivors were in great distress and disgrace, and that the wall of Jerusalem was in shambles and its gates had been burned with fire. See, unwalled cities in ancient times had no defense against the enemies. So they were dismissed as insignificant cities. So for Jerusalem to lack walls was a disgrace to the city God had chosen. And it brought dishonor to the Lord. As he tried to imagine the shame in the city of David, he could barely stand it. The phrase great distress meant that the people, the people had broken down and were falling to pieces. Three words summarize the bad news. Remnant, ruin, and reproach. Nehemiah was broken over it. He was broken over the complacency of the people of Jerusalem. They were living in ruins and they accepted it. They were willing to walk around in the, the devastation instead of being concerned enough to do something about their situation. Friends, nothing is going to change in your life, in the life of this church, or for that matter, in our nation until we become concerned about the problem. We've been complacent about the way our life is going. We're living in rubble, and it doesn't even bother us anymore. Are you ready to allow God to do some rebuilding? If so, you need to become concerned about the problem by listening to the facts, even if you don't want to hear them. You know, Chuck Swindoll, he said, quite frankly, I think the walls of our lives often lie in ruins through neglect. Listen, the leader who brings us to rebuild the walls is the Holy Spirit. He is the one who continues the work of reconstruction inside us. He tries his best to bring to our attention the condition of our walls but sometimes we don't hear what he's saying, not because we're hard of hearing. We simply don't listen to the Holy Spirit. Some of us are living with the walls of our life surrounded by ruin, and it all began very slowly. First, there was a, a loose piece of stone or mortar. Then there was a crack that appeared in the wall, and then it broke into pieces. And then there was a hole. Because of further neglect, the weeds of carnality begin to grow up through the wall. And by and by, the enemy gained free access to your life. See, you may be known as a solid Christian man or a woman, but you know in your heart that although you are a Christian, in the same sense that Jerusalem belonged to the Jews, the wall around your spiritual life that protects you and defends you is in shambles. I mean, such things like selfishness, a lack of discipline, procrastination, immorality, not making time for God, compromise, and maybe just disobedience and rebellion have come and they've sowed their ugly seeds and they've begun to bear 
poisonous fruit. See, Nehemiah, wrapping this up, Nehemiah is about to give up a life as a wealthy official in order to live in ruins and build a wall. He will leave the most beautiful city in the known world and move to a city that has been in ruins for many years. He leaves the protection of the most powerful city to move to a city that is no longer powerful. He's willing to sacrifice his own comfort to serve God and his people. Let me tell you, here's how you grow a prayer meeting. You pray till others are praying with you. You pray at first by yourself until others are praying with you. That's the example we see in Nehemiah. You know, at the end of verse 11, we find a great prayer. We could pray as we go forth into our daily calling. Let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. I mean, we've all heard the prayer of Jabez. This is the prayer of Nehemiah Bez. We all have an Artaxerxes, this man, to deal with on a daily basis that we should be prepared to meet. We have someone that God has given us to share with. We need to be ready. Let's pray. Loving Father, I thank you for this time and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the example of Nehemiah. I pray, Father, that you would continue to to mold and shape your people. I pray that you would help us to have a vision of what you want to do. Father, that we would not go around griping and complaining, but Father, that we would be seeking you and seeking your vision and seeking what you want to do, that maybe you are doing something new, Father, that you would speak to us and that we would hear your voice. And Father, that we as memorial would know exactly what you are wanting us to do. Father, because we are all in prayer, because we are all concerned about the problem that is going on in our lives, in our, in our church, in our nation, Father, that you would help us to discern these times, even like the sons of Issachar, that we would have wisdom and know what we should do and what America should do and what Memorial should do and what the Adams family should do. Father, I pray that you would help us to discern the times. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for this time. Guide us in a time of response. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us in our worship time together this morning. You know, we have to pray, and then we need to be prepared to work. See, God is still seeking men and women willing to sacrifice to do His work. My question is, are you available? Like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So I ask the question, what steps can you take this week to strengthen your prayer life? Pray until others are praying with you. Are you ready to open up your life to Jesus Christ, to follow him? You know, maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken something to your heart this morning and you'd like to to talk to someone about that. Maybe you would like to invite Jesus into your heart. Maybe, Maybe you would like to follow the Lord in baptism. Maybe you would like to do other things. Maybe uh, you sense a, a call to missions or to ministry. Whatever God is doing in your life. I want to give you an opportunity to call someone and to pray with you. This morning, if you want to reach out, if you want to call somebody, talk to them, to pray with them about your relationship or about any of the things I've I've mentioned, I just ask you to call the number on your screen. You know, my brother and friend, Joel Shoemate, he'll answer your call this morning when you call. The number's 254-541-8212. for power.
I'd like to thank you again for joining us for worship this morning. Next Sunday is May 31st. Please join us again right here, 1045, on our NBC Temple YouTube channel for our morning worship service. And let's hear from you. Let us know if you're tuning in, maybe connecting with us on the live chat or sending us a text or email or something. But it's, it's a, a wonderful blessing to know who's listening, who's tuning in, uh, just to, to be able to encourage one another in that. But until then, I just want to say enjoy this Lord's Day. Um, have, a, have a good and safe Memorial Day tomorrow. Let's pray for our neighbors, building up our compassion for them. And go in the power of the Holy Spirit to be Christ's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Remember, He's with us always, even to the end of the world. God bless you.